Yes, please. Yes, yes. I'm ready. Yeah. So, uh, good evening. Uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, 25th uh, case series in uh, peculiar transplant, and we have started in uh, August 20, uh, 2021. I think probably we missed one or two. It's going in a full swing, and uh, every month uh, we are looking eagerly forward to have this such kind of meeting because it's a, a knowledge sharing platform. And uh, and today we we have a two uh, presentation as well. Uh, we have two panelists. I introduce one by one, and. So, ma'am, first we, ma'am is going to present Dr. Suman Latha. Uh, she's the product of Fall India Institute of Medical Science, New Delhi. Uh, she developed a, a renal transplant program and teaching uh, program in the uh, Institute of uh, Liver and Bleed and Sciences. And uh, there's an autonomous institute under the government uh, for, for Delhi. Subsequently, she moved out. Thereafter, the institute became a, a center of excellence for teaching as well as a high-end nephro care. Then she worked in an RN super specialty hospital, Guru Gram, as a director and a clinical lead in a real transplant. Uh, now, Madam is working in a Fortis Muller, a Fortis Hospital, and she is the a proud possessor of a lot of achievements in the recipient of award, awards in the last 20 plus career, right? Uh, uh, so, Ma'am is going to talk on a subject uh, which is a very, uh, very uh, you know, unusual in, in, in our setup. I think I'm first time hearing such kind of uh, complications in a post transplant. Um, welcome, ma'am. And uh, we have another speaker, young speaker, uh, Dr. Santia Suresh. He is MBBS from uh, uh, Madras Medical College, MD from CMC, and DNB from Muljibai Patel Biological Hospital, Nadia. And uh, now she is working as, 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 as Assistant Professor in the Institute of um, um, Higher Education and Research, um, Chennai. She is the young recipient of Nephrologist Award for Best Clinical Science Abstract at ISN uh, WC, WC in 2021, also Lalit Shah Award in uh, ISN West Zone 2020. And uh, she's going to present uh, uh, as, a, as a, the great masquerader uh, in a feverous um, masquerader and how she came to a conclusion that um, the final diagnosis is going to have that kind of, I mean, I don't reveal all those details now. And now we have a two panelists, very eminent panelists we have. We are proud to have Dr. Cherian sir, and I have personally respect him for a lot for many things. One is his years of experience, more than 25 years and plus. And uh, sir is, uh, did an MBBS from Kiel Park Medical College, Chennai, then MD from uh, Paimathur Medical College. Then he did a MDM from M Madras Medical College in 1997. And since 2018, she is working in, the, uh, sir is working in the Ramakrishna Medical College, uh, Medical Hospital in Coimbatore. And he was given the Distinguished Service to the Humanity Award by the Indian Medical Association 2008. And sir is the um, appraiser for DNB program and the various uh, institutions as an examiner. And sir, one word I would say, he would win or beat anyone with his politeness. Very unassuming, down to earth, such a such a even high posture. I mean, position still he stood down to any level. And uh, such a kind man I've ever seen in my life. And uh, and in Tamil there is one proverb: the the full of water pot uh, does not shake or spill. Uh, so if the mass picture doesn't sag, that's what they say. I I, I optimize in that way in your in your character, sir. Welcome, you, sir. And uh, another uh, dynamic man. I distantly I used to admire from Trichy, uh, the man who was in Coimbatore, Dr. Ilango, uh, is um, an MBBS from Jipmer, Puducherry. Uh, 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 now earlier it was called Partition, it's Puducherry, and um, DM from. Uh, uh, MD from Jipper same institute, and he did a uh, MD from uh, same uh, DM from CMC Valor. And afterwards, he worked in various um, a hospital as an uh, assistant uh, professor, like you know, in a MS Ramayam uh, Hospital in Bangalore, uh, Ramayam Medical Institute Hospital in Bangalore, then Mahatma Gandhi Medical College Hospital, uh, Puducherry, and afterwards in the Pondicherry Institute of Medical Science. Then he had a long stint in uh, Paimbatore whereby he is known to everyone in our state and across our country. And between 2014 and 2021, as a senior consultant, I was heading the department, very aggressive uh, um, transplant physician. And he used to teach uh, his students. He is, under, uh, he is a proud uh, teacher for six students. After he left, I think the program is now in uh, limbo. And anyway, he's going to come soon and he'll start resuming the same attitude that he had earlier. And uh, he has presented a lot of papers and uh, he has... Um, uh, he has he written a book chapter in the Fluid and Electrolytes, edited by Dr. Jaji, and he's a, a proud um, um, a, um, a recipient of a Bansal Varishan Award in uh, 2018 for his pool dialysis, like in 
hypothermia uh, in, uh, induce hypothermia during dialysis uh, preventing the hypertension the people often talk about hypertension no one talks about the hypotension so he did us uh, an innovative study on that he was awarded for that in uh, 2018 and uh, he's a reviewer of many uh, uh, journals and books and uh, it's a uh, he's an invited speaker for many one uh, many uh, conferences and also the best uh, is accorded with the best hockey player in 1996. 1996 or 2000, uh, uh, meet, you had a best hockey. So I think, so this is all the uh, credits to, to uh, Dr. Hilango. We have a, uh, two presentations followed by the discussion. So we'll stick on to time. We'll start now it's 8.5 and we'll finish by 9.5. And I now hand over to Dr. Sumilaga ma'am for his for her first presentation. Ma'am, please unmute yourself, ma'am. Yeah, good evening, everyone. At the outset, uh, am I audible, Dr. Veer? Yes, 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 absolutely. You are very clear, crystal yes. clear. Uh, good evening, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Veil for creating this platform and giving me opportunity to present the today case. And uh, I'm also thankful to uh, my panelists also who are very esteemed and it's a proud moment for me, actually, they are chairing the session today. And uh, let me start my case presentation. You can share your slide, ma'am. Uh, can you see my slides, Dr. Veer? No, ma'am, I can see only your face, and uh, yet you have to share your slides. Just a second. Yeah, yeah, take, take a few seconds. Yeah, sure. You can see my slides now? Yeah. Yeah, no, okay. Make it a full screen and go ahead, ma'am. Yes, yeah. Today I'm presenting a case of post kidney transplant Armageddon, a surviving ordeal. Here is Mr. AK, 42 year old male who is travel agent by occupation. He's non diabetic, but he's hypertensive and he was requiring three antihypertensive drugs. His basic disease was FSGS biopsy prover, which was done outside at some hospital. The details of the biopsy was not available. He received, uh, you know, the couple of weeks of steroids, and later on, he was put on dialysis in view of advanced renal failure. He came can to you us. A, can, can you make it a full slide, ma'am? And uh, it's not in play mode. It comes in a. I think I've already done the full actually. Yeah, yeah, it comes in a slide outline mode and uh, still you make it bigger. Okay, if it is, it's it's not able to do it, please leave, leave it, ma'am. Uh, yes, yeah, I'm not able to do actually, Dr. Will, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so we listed, uh, he, yeah, we listed him for the disease kidney transplant as no suitable donor in the family. And these are the recipient details. He was, height was 177 centimeter, weight was 65 kg. BMI was 23 kg. And as I already mentioned, he was on your slide is not moving. It's static at your first slide. Okay. Can you see the slides now? Ma'am, you have to you have to change the screen sharing, ma'am. You have, you are sharing the the presentation. You have to share the the full screen mode. Okay, just a second. Let me try again. Shakti, guide, ma'am. Ma'am, you can press Alt, uh, you can press the screen share more, madam. In that, yeah, you can show the windows. Yeah, I have already pressed the screen share. Just a second. I'll do it again. I'll close it and then I'll... Yeah, do it again, ma'am. Raj, welcome. Welcome, sir. Sorry, sir. Right. Got an yeah, image no, okay. You are on time, man. Just don't worry, yeah. Raj. Yeah, yeah. Time. Thank you for the nice intro, sir. Your text is perfect. Okay, thanks. Just a second. I'm sorry. Can we start with the second presentation in the meantime? I'll, you know, I think there's some issues. No issues, ma'am. And uh, okay, can we go with Sandhya's presentation? Uh, so that we don't waste time, actually. In the meantime, I'll correct it. Yeah. yeah. Sandhya, are you ready? Yes, sir. I can start my presentation. Yes. Okay. I'm audible. Yeah, absolutely.
Is it in a screen share mode? Yeah, yeah, yeah you're on the full screen. Please go ahead. So let me start off um, by thanking the organizers for inviting me for the uh, this session. Um, I would like to take you all through the twists and turns of a transplant. We all know that uh, transplant is often accompanied by a lot of twists and turns, and uh, which often baffle us at every uh, single uh, location. So here we had one such patient who's a 50-year-old live-related renal transplant recipient who presented about seven months post-transplant with high-grade fever and chills and rigors and abdominal pain and loose stools for five days and a decrease in urine output for three days. He later developed progressive dyspnea requiring mechanical ventilation. So here is a gist, and now I'll go into the details of his pre-transplant history. He's a 50-year-old, but his history dates back to 2011, about 12 years back, when he was diagnosed with nephrotic syndrome. Biopsy then showed FSGS, which was initially steroid responsive, but he was lost to follow up thereafter. About five years later in 2016, he presented again with proteinuria of uh, 10 grams per day, a creatinine of 1.8 and hypertension. He was started on steroids again, but this time there was no response. He stopped all medications. He was lost to follow up, took some native medications and presented back to us in 2018 with uremic symptoms, creatinine of 14.5 with USG showing bilateral small echogenic kidneys. At this point in time, he was initiated on hemodialysis and thereafter he was on maintenance hemodialysis thrice a week for four years. In 2022, he underwent live-related renal transplant with donor being maternal uncle. It was an ABO-compatible transplant with a HLA mismatch of 50%. He received basiliximab induction and he was on triple immunosuppression with prednisolone, MMF, and tacrolimus. He received uh, thymethoprim sulfamethoxazole prophylaxis for six months. Uh, we usually dose at septran DS um, thrice a week uh, dosing uh, is what we practice in our center. His post-transplant nadir creatinine was 0.6 milligram per deciliter at discharge, and he also developed uh, diabetes after transplant. Uh, the post-transplant period was uneventful until day 17, when he presented to us with his first episode of UTI. He had fever and dysuria with a rise in counts, and he also had a creatinine increase from 0.6 to 1.6. Urine routine showed pus cells of 80 per high power field. He was initially Hello. started on meropenem. His um, culture showed uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae, which was carbapenem resistant. However, as there was clinical response to meropenem and the creatinine had decreased from 1.6 to 1, he completed a course of meropenem and he was discharged. However, he had recurrence of UTI. He had two further episodes of UTI in the third and fifth months with the same organism, which was carbapenem resistant. At this point, uh, because initially he was only treated with meropenem, we decided to do further evaluation with an expert CARBA R uh, for the carbapenemase gene detection. He was detected to have OXA 48 uh, with susceptibility to septazidium AV bactam on the DISC test. Uh, based on the uh, recent guidelines from the ICMR and also the recent um, uh, algorithms, we treated this patient with septazidium AV bactam. Each time he was treated with septazidium AV bactam, and after the treatment of the third episode, his creatinine remained around 2 to 2.2 milligram per deciliter. So at seven months, he presented to us with fever and loose stools with diffuse abdominal pain for five days and reduced urine output for about three days. His hemoglobin was 10.5, counts were 7,000 at admission. He had thrombocytopenia with 66,000 platelets. His um, creatinine had increased to 3.1 with mild acidosis of 15 um, bicup. His liver parameters were normal with an SGOT, SGPT of 32 and 21. His urine routine did not show any pus cells, or did not show significant pyuria, uh, only three to four pus cells. USG showed transplant kidney of 8.9 centimeters with minimal perinephric fluid, otherwise normal. At this point, uh, this is a patient who is a post-transplant at seven months with uh, NODAT who had history of recurrent UTI. He has presented to us with a febrile illness with diarrhea and acute graft dysfunction. So we evaluated this patient for all causes of post-transplant diarrhea. We did stool for ovacyst, which was negative. We did stool for opportunistic pathogens, including an AFB stain on the stool, which was negative. Stool culture did not show any growth. Clostridium difficile toxin A and B in the stool were negative. Quantitative blood CMV DNA PCR showed 3,300 copies per ml. Uh, at this point, uh, MMF dose was reduced, which was later stopped because his diarrhea did not subside. He was started on valgensiclovir. 
urine culture had also shown enterococcus for which uh, ampicillin was added his blood cultures were negative during this course of admission despite treatment with broad spectrum of antibiotics and um, uh, despite treatment with valgancyclovir he continued to have fever spikes he then developed cough and progressive dyspnea over a period of one week and later required intubation for respiratory distress uh, so he had also progressive worsening of his lab parameters so from his admission creatinine of 3.1 a week later at the time uh, that he was intubated his creatinine had gone up to 4.1 developed severe acidosis with bicarb of 6 counts had gone up to 10000 platelets further dropped to 46000 his liver parameters also started get becoming deranged with transaminitis and bilirubin also increasing to 2.2 mg per deciliter so we can see his trend of creatinine so after each episode of uti his creatinine bumped up never came back down to baseline and now presented with his current uh, problems after the uh, acute diarrheal episode and then later progressing to pulmonary involvement so this is his chest x ray you can see that there were patchy opacities in bilateral lung fields and uh, this this is his um, ct cuts hr ct cuts uh, we can see that there are these nodular um, um, uh, opacities with areas of these are the nodular opacities which can be clearly made out and also areas of ground glass opacities were also seen was also reported to have a green blood blood or green bud appearance and also calcified mediastinal lymph nodes were present so overall what were the possibilities so here we have a post transplant puo with a multi system involvement presenting with graft dysfunction he had involvement of the gi system pulmonary system hematological system as well as the liver uh, we had a broad set of in, uh, of um, differential diagnosis at this time with invasive fungal infection being at the top of our list cmv disseminated tb nocardiosis and cryptococcus were also among our differential diagnosis so what did we do further uh, we repeated the cmv dna pcr this patient had received a week of valgancyclovir uh, his cmv dna pcr had decreased to less than 50 copies per ml uh, as in a covid uh, pandemic we did a covid rt pcr which was negative h1n1 swab was also done it was negative he underwent a bronchoscopy and ball a uh, gram stain fungal smear afb stain everything was negative galactomannan was 1.7 which is higher than the 0.5 cut off so it was positive culture showed no growth fungal culture showed no growth at this point so we thought this was a patient of um, an invasive fungal infection we started him on iv amphotericin however his condition further deteriorated about 5 uh, days later his blood culture was reported positive for an organism an appropriate therapy was started uh, however it was too late for him and he succumbed to his illness within about 2 days of this diagnosis so finally what was the diagnosis that we got in this patient this was a blood culture about 5 days after incubation we can see the powdery uh, white colonies on the blood agar and on the chocolate agar and on the gram stain we can see that um, these are the fine filamentous um, uh, gram positive um, um, organisms which are seen Uh, so the powdery colonies on blood and chocolate agar pates and thin filamentous branching gram positive which were also mildly acid fast uh, this was reported as a nocardia further on um, a 16s rrna sequencing was also done based on which the species was identified as nocardia concava so our final diagnosis in this patient was a disseminated nocardiosis so as part of this case i wanted to present this second case we know that misfortune sometimes occurs in doubles so about a few months later we had the second patient who presented to us a 37 year old uh, transplant recipient um, who is um, um, with a mother donor who did not receive any induction who was on triple immunosuppression uh, post transplant about 3 months after transplant uh, uh, sorry about 5 months after transplant he had a borderline rejection for which his steroid dose was increased he presented to us about 7 um, months post transplant with cough and fever and uh, we can see on the chest x ray that there is a right lower zone thick walled cavity and in the uh, ct there was a right uh, uh, lower zone large nodule with central cavitation and also multiple other nodules were also noted in both lungs so his ball done immediately because uh, we had already experienced nocardia we had nocardia quite high on our list of differentials and uh, the ball was immediately reported as a nocardia Uh, based on the gram positive and acid fast uh, stains and um, uh, he was started on em empirically on septran uh, uh, however uh, the culture 
was negative for um, uh, uh, the culture showed Tonkaria was resistant to the co-trimoxazole. As a result of which, he was started on imipenem and linazolin. However, two weeks after starting therapy, this patient developed um, uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Uh, his MRI brain showed multiple abscesses in um, the parietal, in the right um, frontal, parietal, and in the left occipital uh, uh, zones. Um, in view of this, he was started on ceftriaxone, imipenem, and uh, linazolid, however, had to be stopped because he had um, thrombocytopenia. So ceftriaxone, imipenem, and amikacin were continued. However, this patient also developed a severe sepsis and succumbed to his illness. So considering this uh, two patients of disseminated nocariosis, which really stumped us, uh, we wanted to discuss uh, further about uh, nocaria and keep it high, high in our list of differentials and to show that nocaria is not an uncommon infection in the post-transplant setting. So this is just a stamp which was um, a um, which was presented in France uh, uh, to, fe to felicitate um, Dr. Edmund Nocard after who is a veterinarian after which the nocardiosis is named. So what is nocardia? Uh, it is a filamentous acid fast, a partially acid fast gram positive filamentous branching bacteria. It is ubiquitous. It is present everywhere in the environment, present mainly in soil and aquatic um, environments, and it can enter into humans in multiple uh, routes. And the most common route is usually the inhalational route, and that's why the pulmonary involvement is maximum in nocardiosis. What about in solid organ transplants? Um, as expected, lung transplants have the highest uh, risk of nocardiosis with 0.8 to 3.5%. Uh, kidney transplants come lower in the list at 0.04 to 1.2%. Uh, one of the largest studies was the one by Dr. G.T. John from CMC Vellore, where they reported 27 patients of uh, kidney transplant uh, recipients uh, who had nocardiosis over a period of 30 years, giving an incidence of 1.3%. Most of the cases of nocardiosis in solid organ transplants occurs in one to two years after the transplant. What are the risk factors uh, for nocardia in solid organ transplants? These are, this is based on a European study which looked at um, the risk and uh, found that uh, there were five uh, definite associations. Uh, one was a high uh, CNA trough levels in the month before diagnosis, use of tacrolimus, uh, use of high dose steroids, and a long duration of stay in the ICU after solid organ transplant, as well as CMB in the preceding six months were associated with um, risk of nocardiosis. Uh, in our patient, we can see that uh, there was use of tacrolimus, use of high dose steroids, as well, of, as, well as uh, CMB in the preceding six months in, uh, in these two recipients. Uh, although low-dose uh, trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole prophylaxis has been reported in some trials as, um, uh, as a prophylaxis for nocardia, this study did not find that uh, there was a lower incidence in, of nocardiosis in patients who, are, who were on low-dose prophylaxis. Uh, I will speak a little bit more about it later. So what are the sites of involvement in noca of nocardia in solid organ transplant? As I said, uh, lungs are the most commonly affected organ. Almost 86 percentage of uh, the nocardiosis in solid organ transplants have lung involvement. Uh, second most common is skin and soft tissue. Most commonly, it is by direct inoculation. Uh, brain is the other organ which is often involved, 26 percent, as we could see in our second case. And uh, disseminated nocardiosis, which is defined as an infection of at least two non-contagious organs, occurs in about 43 percentage of, our, of uh, transplant recipients, which is a considerable number. And both our patients, unfortunately, had disseminated nocardiosis with involvement of multiple systems. Uh, the clinical presentation is often atypical. Uh, most studies have shown that in over 60 percentage of the cases are initially misdiagnosed as either TB or fungal infections. That's why it is called as the great masquerader in uh, some uh, studies. Uh, the, lung, uh, the lung involvement can also present in multiple uh, fashions. It can present as nodules. It can present as an endo endobronchial mass. It can present as an abscess. It can present as a cavitatory disease or a pleural effusion or empyema. Typically, nocardia is known for its um, um, abscess forming capacity because of its, uh, uh, of its slow replication. As neutrophils are the first line of defense for nocardia, it tends to form abscesses. So how do we diagnose nocardia? So nocardia is one infection where we uh, need to coordinate with our uh, microbiologists. If this is among our list of differentials, we need to inform our microbiologists that this is among our list and that the blood cultures have to be, uh, blood cultures or any cultures that we send have to be incubated for a longer period of time. 
um, it usually grows in blood or bcye agar or in mycobacterial culture media for about in about 5 days but it may take as long as 3 weeks and a prolonged incubation may be required in these cases on gram stain it is seen as gram positive thin branching filamentous uh, bacilli with right angle branching Uh, what about the species and antimicrobial resistance so i talked about uh, i briefly touched upon the species in our first case so what is the importance of that there are three main species of um, nocardia which have been implicated in um, nocardiosis in the post transplant setting uh, the most common is this farsinska complex which um, and the others are the seria c georgica and the n nova complex so how do we identify the species in our patient we did the 16s rrna sequencing but other uh, molecular targets like the heat shock protein and say k1 can also be used a proteomic uh, analysis by malditoff can be done which gives a very rapid diagnosis and um, uh, if it is available then we can um, uh, use it for rapid diagnosis and early therapy for these patients but why do we need to know the species uh, because of antimicrobial resistance uh, many of us we give um, um, cotrimoxazole as the empirical therapy as soon as nocardia is identified but in many centers and in many centers across the world a lot of species of um, uh, nocardia which are resistant to tmp smnx are being identified especially the farsinica complex and the um, and certain other complex like pseudo brasiliensis um, so it is important to know these um, uh, the species in order to identify the empirical therapy that we can give once nocardia is identified uh, what about the treatment uh, these are from the ast guidelines the american society of transplant uh the first line therapy are the um, sulfonamides and the most common sulfonamide which used is the trimethoprim sulfonitroxazole which is usually used as the uh, first line treatment in pulmonary nocardiosis in patients with uh, critical pulmonary involvement a combination of two drugs is used this is basically used because of uh, known um, uh, resistance to antimicrobials there is also synergy between uh, these drugs for the treatment of nocardiosis uh, it as a result it, a combination of medications may be more effective in these patients in patients with very severe involvement even a combination of three drugs like imipenem amikacin and trimethoprim sulfonitroxazole have been used uh, what about the duration of therapy uh, there is really no consensus but uh, most uh, study uh, most guidelines suggest a parenteral therapy of at least 3 to 6 weeks until the patient is stabilized and until there is at least radiological resolution after which the oral therapy should be continued for at least 6 to 12 months what about the outcomes before 1950s the mortality was almost 100% it is still quite high at about 20% mortality especially in severe disease uh, settings the one year mortality is 10 times higher in solid organ transplants with nocardiosis versus controlled solid organ transplants which uh, again brings us back to the importance of identifying this infection in our recipients so what about uh, prevention uh, does um, uh, septran prophylaxis really prevent nocardia that is one question that i sought to answer and uh, did a data search on this um although it is a cost effective um, therapy and it prevents many other infections like tcp uh, it is thought that um, uh, many studies have not shown found any uh, difference in patients who were treated and who were not treated with um, uh, septran prophylaxis uh, in fact um, uh, in some studies have shown that about 20% of cases were on septran prophylaxis at the time of uh, development of nocardia infections therefore breakthrough infections occur uh, whether this is the effect of the lower dose that we use in solid organ transplant where we use only 2 to 3 times of um, uh, per week of uh, double do- double strength uh, tablets um, so whether this may be the cause for the lack of uh, prof- protective uh, effect and uh, a daily dose may reduce the rate of nocardia infection in solid organ transplant uh, another effect of the uh, septran could be that it even if it doesn't prevent it may reduce the severity of infection in our first patient uh, the trimethoprim sulfonitroxazole prophylaxis was stopped at 6 months after the transplant uh, there is definitive data uh, of um, uh, septran prophylaxis for secondary prophylaxis after an infection of um, nocardia nocardia usually different doses have been tried but most uh, guidelines suggest one double strength tablet once a day to prevent relapse and at least for 24 months or even lifelong after the infection of nocardiosis so what about our take home message um, it's important to note that nocardia is not uncommon in the solid organ transplant setting we need a high degree of clinical suspicion and we need to alert our microbiology lab that this is among our differential diagnosis Uh, if available we can use rapid diagnostic tests like malditoff to identify up to species level 
or as in our case, we can use the 16 as rRNA. Uh, there is importance um, uh, should be given to antimicrobial resistance testing. As we could see in our second patient, it was resistant to uh, septran. Uh, there is more data which will be required on optimal duration of nocardia treatment and the utility of prophylaxis. Thank you. Thank you, Sandhya. Uh, when we share the slide, we'll go for the quick uh, panel discussion and, um, and take questions from audience also, I mean, and the viewers. Very excellent, actually. You have worked up nicely. Um, ultimately, we lost two patients. That's a very unfortunate thing, but you gave us a lot of message. Uh, Ilango, uh, please, uh, and we'll start with a... I think I have already shared my slides with the organizers. Maybe they can display because I'm not able to. Yes, madam. Colleague is present. Yes. <laughs> You want to try saying that? Please, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Sandhya, great presentation. Um, uh, so, I think um, before uh, I, I could uh, take more questions from the audience, also, I, I need some clarifications. Like, you have two cases, it's very unfortunate. Like, sometimes bad things happen. So, uh, uh, what was the dose of steroid you, you normally uh, leave the patients on after? Uh, three months, um, and, uh, how, and did you give um, uh, separate prophylaxis after the steroid pulse in the second case? Uh, and... In the second case, he was on separate prophylaxis. The first patient it was stopped after uh, six months, uh, and this, he he presented to us at seven months uh, post transplant. So, uh, our usual dosing for steroids is that we reduce it to 10 by the end of three months. And by the end of um, six months, it's usually reduced to uh, seven, 5 to 7.5 <clears throat> milligram uh, per day. Uh, however, in the second patient, uh, we had actually increased his dose of steroids to 10 um, as he had a borderline rejection on the biopsy that was done about three months prior to the uh, onset of the infection. So I think every center has the protocol is uh, varies a little bit. And I think you, you may have to relook into your steroid dosing. Um, I mean, if, if there is the cases uh, like you have so many cases like this. And um, do you, uh, what is your protocol like um, uh, in patients coming with bronchopneumonia? So how uh, how rapidly you do a ball? Like for example, in, in our centers, we, we do ball very early because you know, like early ball, and uh, you know, opportunistic infections, the, the faster you treat, better it is. So how, how many days later you did the ball for the first patient? Uh, for the first patient, as soon as he had pulmonary involvement, we did the ball. But the ball actually did not show anything in him. His uh, ball cultures and fungal stain eventually never grew anything. It was a blood culture which showed the nocardia. In the second patient, also the ball was done immediately and it was reported as nocardia. However, the uh, bacterial growth on culture and the resistance testing uh, did not, um, uh, the bacterial growth on culture took a long time. Hence, we did not have a resistance um, uh, report on him. And so he was only on empirical therapy with um, um, cotrimoxazole. I think uh, one of the uh, Shakti has quoted a study which said that in um, outside India, 42% is a resistance. Yes. I think so. I think. Uh, from your case, I think it's. Uh, I think we all should be careful. We cannot trust yes. too much the uh, so combination of two drugs. In fact, uh, after uh, we got the resistance testing, I, at that point also he did not have CNS manifestations. He was started on imipenem plus uh, linezolid, two drug combination. About two weeks later, presented to us with CNS manifestations. So I think the first case you had uh, a patient had too many infection, mostly the urinary. Yes. Uh, infection and um, there is one thing that uh, it's a seldom known um, known thing among the transplant community. It is like when patients have graft dysfunction, the oral bioavailability of microfilament increases. Yes, it increases and the risk of infection also increases. That's why we see patients with graft dysfunction tend to have more infections than people with uh, near normal graft functions. Uh, so there's not much uh, literature available, but in centers who do um, microfilament AUC, I think they would get to see because. I remember an interesting case where patient before uh, with graft dysfunction had very high microfenolate level, even with 125 milligram uh, twice daily of microfenolate. But post second transplant, uh, she was getting two grams BD. I'm sorry, one gram BD. So that was amount of uh, uh, amount of um, change of oral viability. So she was getting 250 per day with toxic level, but uh, post second transplant with good graft function, she the same patient 
had um, um, she was she had she was taking one gram twice uh, two grams per day to maintain the same drug level. So I think the first case that could have been one more contributing factors apart from the other factors you you listed. So this is something that we we have to be mindful of, especially people with repeat infection um, and with graft dysfunction. Did he look for modified zealin sensing? Or you are not using yes. that technique no more? Yes, sir. yes, sir. We did. Uh, sir. Both were uh, in uh, both the settings. It was AFB positive. Uh, yeah, both settings it was positive. In both the settings, in both the patients, it was positive. The AFB but was then uh, uh, why diagnosis was delayed? For no, the it case. was not detected on the bulk, sir. It was only on the culture plate that the uh, the growth was positive for um, AFB. Only in the culture The stain plate. itself was not. See, positive. the first one in the presentation was very atypical. It started with very the GA tract. Well, first time yes. he didn't have much lung involvement. Only when he became very bad, went on ventilator, then you had some lung infiltration. Yes. Uh, second one, you had a typical nodular lesion in the... That, that was... That yes. also sputum did not show any modification. That, that ball was positive for uh, on the sputum itself picked up the no cardiac. But yes, it did but not. Unfortunately, it also culture. had a cerebral involvement and it yes, was resistant yeah. to cotrim also. Yes, it was resistant. It was sensitive to everything else. It was only resistant to cotrim also. Okay, nice. And uh, your presentation itself uh, depicted a lot of explanation. I think the the people who have viewed very clearly, watched your slides very closely, I think would have understood you have nicely worked up. And um, do you do you know some all this uh, sub subspecies detection and all? Uh, the speciation was sent to uh, sent outside the 16s rRNA sequencing was sent out uh, by our microbiology That's department. Good thinking, I, themselves, uh, it's a good thinking. You've done a right job, right? So it's, it's learning for everyone for us. So I I because have to thank our microbiology department because they had paid from their own pocket and did the uh, speciation for the first patient. Uh, so. I think the whole presentation that is a fascinating one. And that is a real take home message. Thanks. And I think this discussion will go on forever because this is the third time we had, uh, we have uh, Nocardia as the, you know, masqueraded one George Kurian presented earlier with two cases subsequent, but that patient survived. And as another Dr. Murugana, Murugana from Coimbatore, he presented on just a WhatsApp discussion and you are presenting. Again and again, the point that people are iterating is that. This should not be, you know, missed uh, in our differential diagnosis. And you narrated very nicely. A lot of take-home points you have given. And thanks, Sandhya, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay. Well, I had only two cases. I have come across only two, two of my patients at Nocodia, but uh, both happened almost some 15, 16 years back. They were, that time I used to use cyclosporine, azathioprine, and prednisone. Not even microfinal, it was in the regular usage. Yes, so I had two cases, both presented with lung nodule, Picked up early with a sputum examination, no ball, no CT chest, nothing. So many things were not available. Uh, so both of them, they respond to cotrimoxol and uh, they become better. And uh, one patient after fourth month when he was on little reduced dose of cotrimoxol, he had a stroke. I thought it must be an abscess and uh, did a CT. It was turned out to be a massive infarct and he succumbed to it. Other patient totally recovered. He, I gave course for three months, two TDS and then one TDS for another two, three months and slowly stopped. Uh, but that time, we, didn't, we don't go for very high immunosuppression. Simple other day, brain, and uh, yes, cyclosporine. Even I looked at our uh, hospital data. Over the last five years, we didn't have any uh, patients. Until this, in this one year, we had two patients. So. Okay, Sandhya. That's thanks and, uh, Thank you, for accepting our invitation and you presented nicely. Uh, Ma'am, uh, can we go with your case? Yeah, um, yeah, please, yeah. Ma'am, you, yeah. though there are 20 minutes, uh, you you can take 30 minutes. I, because I, you I, said I will that rush. I will you rush. Go yeah. with your own, own pace and rhythm, and uh, we will not interrupt you because uh, we are going to learn a lot from you. Yeah. Good Thank evening, you, everyone. And uh, straight away, I'm going for my case presentation as we are running short of time. This is a post renal transplant. Armageddon is surviving ordeal. Can you change the slides, please? Next slide, please. Thank you, Pandi. Thank you, Pandi. Uh, yeah. Please. Yeah, I am moving. Yes, please, please be watchful over here, man. Yes, yeah. So here is Mr. AK, 42-year-old male. He's 
travel agent by occupation he was non diabetic and hypertensive his basic disease was fsgs biopsy proven which was a biopsy was done outside and he received steroids for a couple of weeks the details of the biopsy as well as the treatment was not available we listed him for the disease kidney transplant as no suitable donor in the family next please so these are the recipient details you can see the weight was 65 kg bmi was 23 uh, he was requiring three antihypertensive drug and the basic disease was fsgs he was on maintenance hemodialysis thrice per week excess was left radiocephalic fistula his native urine output was 1.5 liter per day he also had history of tubercular lymphadenitis which was treated Two years ago, it was right cervical lymph node involvement. Ejection fraction was normal. There was no history of blood transfusion. His blood group was A positive. Next slide, please. Next, please. These are the on twenty sixth uh, January twenty fifteen. We got a call for the disease kidney uh, donation, and uh, unfortunately, donor was very young, disease sixteen months male child, and the cause of death was blunt trauma head due to fall from height. Brain dead was declared in two independent neurological examinations six hours apart, and the consent was obtained for the organ harvesting from the parents. Donor was hemodynamically stable. He was not on any inotropic support. He had urine output about 30 to 20 to 30 ml per hour. His blood group was A positive. Viral markers was negative. An ultrasound revealed the right kidney size 5.3 and the left kidney was 5.2. Next one. Next, please. We have next slide, please. we have two uh, recipient on selections there were two patient with the same blood group at our center first was mr mr he was 14 year old male and second was mr ak which i am presenting today 42 year old male mr mr was rejected because of the multiple reason on ultrasound there was thick and bladder bilateral hydronephrosis i think he was under evaluated for the transplant at that and his lower urinary tract require more proper evaluation we selected mr ak he was fit for the transplant and immunological test cdc flu cross match was negative next please next please next slide anga pandit Coming to the organ harvesting, disease donor deemed fit for the liver and kidney harvesting. Access to portal vein and aorta via left femoral artery established. Intracorporeal eye school perfusion with custodial solution was done. Liver was removed first, and kidney was removed and blocked with aorta and IVC from infrahepatic portion till bifurcation in the iliac vessels and ureter till their insertion in the bladder. Next, please. So if I am unable to show with the pointers because Santosh is, uh, you know, uh, operating from there and showing my slides. If you look at the level of the transaction, there are three level of the transaction. He had to be the surgery team took out the liver along with the. Yeah, sorry. He had to be the surgery removed the liver along with the. up uh, just above the origin of the renal artery and drainage of the renal vein they transected the aorta and ivc second transaction line of transaction you can see just above the bifurcation of the iliac vessel and the third level of the transaction was entry of the ureter just above the bladder so these were the level of the transaction for our n block kidney transplant next please next slide if we look at the diagrammatic presentation on the left side you can see the transaction uh, n block kidneys after the transactions and on the right side you can see the right kidney left kidney and ivc aorta with both the ureters right as well as left next please next slide sanga pandi are you there or somebody is doing that Coming to the recipient, yeah. 
coming to the recipient surgery detail, uh, a modified Gibson incision was given, extra peritoneal space was created, external elect vessels mobilized, and donor IVC to the external elect vein and to side and osteomosis was done. Donor iota to the external iliac artery and to side and osteomosis was done. We gave the heparin 5,000 unit before opening the lamps. Next, please. After opening the clamps, kidney become pink and turgid. It was felt in the donor eye and both the renal arteries. Brisk urine output was seen from both the ureters on table. Modified lich gregor ureter neocystotomy done over 4 by 16 dg stent for both the ureters separate. Next, please. This is the uh, diagrammatic presentation of the bend surgery. And on the left side, the upper one, you can see the upper end of the iota as well as the IVC was sutured. And on the downward diagrams, you can see the posterior aspect of the iota and IVC. We ligated all the branches except the renal artery and the renal veins. And after the branch ligating all the branches, we flushed the iota and to see, to see whether any untied branches left. And on the right side, you can see the right kidney, left kidney, and block kidney transplantation. And beautifully, the donor iota was an uh, osmosis was done with the external iliac artery, and uh, the donor IVC was an with the external iliac vein, and both the ureters with a stent. You can see. This is the next place. Next place, yeah. You can see on the graft Doppler, this was done interoperatively, right kidney and the left kidney. You can see it as upper kidney or the left kidney also now, both were on the same side and the beautiful uh, uh, kidney you can see. Next, please. Next slides. Now coming to the pre and post management of this patient, we were very cautious because this was our first end block at our center. And we gave the induction ATG plus steroids and maintenance just like the adult kidney transplant, we continued with the MMF, taprolimus and steroids. We were aware these patients are at high risk of thrombosis. We use intra-op heparin injection claxin for first post-op week and overhydration till post-op day seven. Daily renal graft doctor was seen to look for any thrombosis or any other event. 5% injection albumin infusion was given for first seven days. Adequate dose of immunosuppression just managed like adult renal allograft, uh, the way we manage in an adult patient. I think this was very important because uh, any kind of event like any hypertension or hypotension or any episode of rejection will reduce the nephron mask in this patient and it will reduce the recovery of the renal growth in this patient. Next, please. You can see in the post-op period and uh, the patient recipient was doing fine at the 10th post-op day. We reached the nadir creatine of around one. He had disc diuresis all the time and uh, the discharge on 11th and 12th day after the transplant. Next slide. Next, please. Yes. We also measured the kidney length on ultrasound for both as well as right kidney as well as left kidney. Prior to surgery, the kidney length was around 5.3 to 5.5 centimeter. You can see by the end of two weeks, it was close to 7 centimeter. Doppler was absolutely normal with the RIE of 0.6 to 0.7. Next one. So here we have a patient ABO compatible and block kidney transplant induction steroid plus ATG with a nadir creatine of 0.8. Next one. Next, please. Post-transplant course of this recipient, his follow-up and compliance was very good. He was very diligent and the patient, because he knew actually this, uh, and he knew the importance of this kidney, his baseline creatinine was 0.7 to 1, urine was banned, he had hypertension, which was well controlled on two antihypertensive, and overall the post-transplant course was very smooth and calm. Between 2015 to 21, there was no history of hospitalization, just couple episodes of couple of episodes of viral illness, which was managed from outdoor basis. Next one. 
As you can see the latest uh, ultrasound graph Doppler of this recipient, you can see the typical Nandi pattern, which Dr. Vail mentioned again and again. And this Nandi pattern gave a lot of joy to all of us as a transplant physician. Next one. Next one. And this is the this is the latest DTP GFR, which is close. GFR is 79 ml per minute, which is excellent at the eight year post transplant. Next one. Next, please. We all know the medicine is a science of uncertainty and art of probability, quoted by William Osler. Next one. On, 20, uh, on 12th November 2021, patient this recipient presented in a transplant clinic with a pain in the back and numbness while at a lower limb for two days prior to admission. He also had decreased urine output for the last one day. There was no history suggestive of any systemic infection like any urinary symptoms or respiratory tract infection. I ordered few investigation while they're sitting in the clinic. I also ordered the MR scan to rule out any local injury and advise admission. Why I advised admission in this patient? Because on clinical exam, everything was fine except the blood pressure was 104 by 66. He's absolutely walking and talking except the pain in the back and the pain was radiating to the hip. There was no other symptoms. There was no tachycardia, chest, CVS. Everything was fine. Spine was normal. There was no neurological deficit. As it clicked into my mind, this patient requiring two antihypertensive and he had decreased urine output. Then I ordered these investigations and you can see in this lab chart, September 21, the patient creatine was 0.8. And 12th November 2011, patient presented to me and I got a call from the lab. The creatine went up to 0.8 and further 4.1. Urea also went up. And the rest of the investigations were okay, except he had a bit of leukocytosis on day second. On 12th, early, the TLC was 10,300. Next slide, please. My working diagnosis, if you look at the lab reports, it was disease and block AV incompatible view compatible transplant, he had acute gravity dysfunctions. Maybe I'm dealing with the ATN, secondary to ischemic or sepsis, hypotension, maybe because of some cardiac event or sepsis. Next one. In the meantime, I got the call from my radiology colleague, actually, he noticed something on MR scan. And you can see I'm unable to show with my pointer. And you can see I marked the arrow. And this is IOTA. You can see there is one black shadow in the iota, this is intimal flap. And here we got the diagnosis that I am dealing with aortic dissection in this patient. We already, at, next slide, please. You can see uh, we ordered the CT iotogram immediately. And uh, you can see there is true lumen, false lumen, and intimal flaps separating both the lumens. Next one. Next slide. This aortic dissection also was going toward the transplant kidney and extending up to that. Here, the diagnosis, radiological diagnosis was type A aortic dissection and which was compromising the renal flow also. And in the meantime, we did the ECO also. On ECO, we had concentric LVH, no regional wall abnormalities, type 2 diastolic dysfunction, there was severe AR and eccentric moderate MR, no TR, RA, RV not dilated, good LV and right ventricle systolic function, ejection reaction was 60%. Next, please. Next one. My final diagnosis now was diseased ABO compatible n block kidney transplant type A acute aortic dissection with a severe AR and normal LV function, acute graft dysfunctions because of the pre-renal secondary to hyperperfusion of the transplanted kidney. Next one. Next one. This fortune never comes alone. On that particular day, there was no CTVS surgeon. My surgeon was on leave. I immediately shifted the patient to the near closest center and I talked to the nephrologist there and I shifted the patient to the Sagangaram hospital and spoke to Dr. Anil Bhalla and he helped me out in getting the bed and arranging everything for this patient. And he got operated on 13th November next day itself in the morning. Dental procedure plus aortic wall graft was 
increased, his urine output improved and the GRAD function normalized in a couple of days. Because he also had aneurysmal dilatation of the left radiocephalic fistula and as per vascular surgeon advice, it was ligated and currently recipient is on anticoagulant plus triple immunosuppression drug. Next one. Challenges, if I talk about the challenges here, it was my first end block kidney transplant, which was difficult. And second was aortic dissection leading to the post-transplant graft dysfunction, which we all know is a not a very usual cause of graft dysfunction. Next one. Next slide, please. Next, please. Coming to uh, uh, regarding discussion about the pediatric end block, uh, I think you all agree we don't deal with all these cases on the regular basis. This was one in my in the last 20 years of professional career. I've seen one case. Pediatric and block kidneys are traditionally considered marginal for transplant into adult due to concerns of technical complications because there is increased graft thrombosis risk, hyperfiltration injury due to the donor recipient body size and metabolic mismatch. There is evidence that the pediatric and block kidneys undergo compensatory growth when exposed to the adult blood flow and metabolic demands. In one study, end block kidneys grew twofold by three to six months and nearly threefold by six months after transplant. Next one. What are the challenges in these pediatric donors? If I talk about challenges, there is, dif there is difficulty in salvage and the transplantation more risk of the graft failure, sorry, there is higher rate of the graft thrombosis, hyperfiltration injury, there is sub risk of suboptimal nephron mass, and previous studies have reported higher incidence of pass or to be related with a small caliber renal arteries, and this incidence was tuned to the 6.4%. What are the problems actually before considering such patient for the end block kidney transplant or the single pediatric kidney transplant? There is no as such defined minimum age for accepting the pediatric kidney, whether to perform pediatric isolated single pediatric kidney transplant or end block things are not very clear. Complications and outcome following pediatric donor kidney transplants, optimal immunosuppression, what immunosuppression we should use for the pediatric kidney patients, long-term graft survival. These are the problems when we see such kind of the patient. Now, the clinical question is whether we should go for the single allocation of the kidney or end block kidney to the one recipient. Allocation of single kidney to pediatric recipient is logical and it gives long, good long term results. But, and it gives, uh, you know, we already have a lot of shortage of the organs. It makes the sense actually we should give one kidney to the one recipient rather than string for the end block. But again, there are problems with that allocation of the single kidney, pediatric kidney. For adult recipient, if you give one small kidney, they are at increased risk of the graft failure. There is risk of hyperfiltration, nephropathy. Relative size of donor and recipient should be taken into the account. And small renal vessel anastomosis, when we consider one kidney, is technically challenging. There is a high risk of thrombosis and graft failure. Vascular thrombosis between 2.5 to 12.5 in small pediatric donors, which is very higher as compared to the standard adult donors. Standard adult donors, we generally see the thrombosis rate is 1.8%. If we look at the literature and compare the graft survival of end block versus single kidney transplant, the survival of end block kidneys at one and three and five years is superior as compared to the single kidney transplant. Scientific registry of transplant recipient data from 1993 through 2002 were remarkable for a 78% high risk for graft loss among recipient of single kidney compared with the end block transplant through donor who weighed less than 21 kg. Therefore, the current practice of using end block versus single pediatric kidney is usually based on the donor age of five years or body weight of 20 kg. If somebody has weight more than 20 kg and more than five years, we consider for the single. Less than that, we consider for the end block. What is the long-term survival of this pediatric end block uh, transplant as compared to the living donor kidney transplant? This was study published in the transplantation 2018. Can we go to the next slides? Next one. 
Next slide, please. Yeah. If we compare the graft survival between end block and the living donor adult transplant, graft survival is almost similar between the end block and the living donor. Next one. If we look at the longitudinal GFR follow up end block and the living donor, you can see that end block are doing fairly better than living donor. Maybe they have two kidneys which have enlarged and the GFR is good actually, as you can see in my case also. Next one. Next one. This was the uh, one case report was done in 2009 in Indian Journal of Nephrology uh, from Dr. Priyadi group and the uh, donor was five year old and the kidney size at the time of transplant was 7.8. At 2.5 year fall of this transplant, each kidney measured 11 centimeter and estimated GFR was 88, which was quite impressive. Next one. Next please. This is the, we also published this case. At that time, it was the youngest reported, youngest diseased end block reported from the India reported this case in 2017 in Indian Journal of Nephrology, Urology. And just to summarize about the end block kidney transplant, graft survival rate tell us that the pediatric kidney donors should not be considered as marginal transplant. Definitely they expand the donor pool, but the challenge is to perform a pediatric end block kidney transplant as opposed to the splitting and performing some single kidney transplant. I think it depends upon the volume of the center also and technical expertise of that particular center, the surgeon, and whether we should consider for the end block or the single pediatric kidney transplant. Unfortunately, there is no widely accepted guidelines to direct the clinician, but yes, if weight is less than 20 kg, if age is less than five years, if kidney length is less than six centimeter, we should consider for the end block. Next one. Now coming to the two, three slides about, the, I know actually we are running short of time, two, three slides about the aortic dissection. Aortic dissection as a cause of graft dysfunction is very uncommon. This was my first piece actually I have seen in my career. The symptoms of aortic dissection may be highly variable and may mimic much more common conditions. Like in this patient, the patient gave the history that he developed these symptoms after playing badminton and he was absolutely fine. And he had just backache, which I thought maybe I'm dealing with the disc prolapse. Yes, I did not do a few more examination and looking for the pulse deficit and the other things when I was in the clinic. And uh, most of the time, I think we ignore all these things, uh, proper clinical examination. And what are the risk factor for the aortic dissection? Male six and uncontrolled blood pressure and the graft dysfunctions. These are the risk factor for the aortic dissection. Hypothesis in this patient could be his iota could have been damaged by the long-term hypertension and by turbulent flow induced by the AV fistula, which may have induced weakness of the medium. But there is not much literature on this, only there is one case report. Risk factor for the aortic dissection, I've already mentioned, unstable blood pressure, atherosclerotic disease. He was on dialysis for two years prior to transplant. Maybe he had hypertension, atherosclerotic disease, and the fistula contributed. And plus this exercise, aerobic exercise, when he was playing badminton, put his stress on the aorta and led to the aortic dissection. Majority of the patients with IOT dissection have sudden severe chest pain. He did not that have typical chest pain, which is present in more than 90% of the patients. He had back pain. He did not have any abdominal pain, which may be maximal at its onset. It may be migratory or may radiate from chest or back to the abdomen or to the lower extremities. However, in some instances, the pain resolves and symptoms may be referable to other complications, such as heart failure from acute aortic regurgitations, neurological deficits, syncope, and vascular insufficiency. Such kind of the patients sometimes don't reach the hospital and sometimes they are admitted sometimes in the neurologic department, depending upon the presentation and involvement of the organ. Type A dissection generally are normotensive and hypotensive on presentation as compared to type B. This patient has hypotension. Hypotension complicating acute aortic dissection is usually related with a cardiac component, aortic rupture, heart failure associated with a severe AR. 
sudden chest and back pain accompanied by the pulse deficit AR and neurological manifestation should alert the clinician to the diagnosis of acute dissection. However, pulse deficit are present only in 19% of type A dissection and 9% of type B dissections. Next one. Takeaway points from this case is early and accurate diagnosis and treatment are crucial for survival. You should not wait for the other worker once you have the diagnosis and you should immediately refer to the patient to the center of the expertise. Patient admitted with us on 12th and 13th, he got operated, although he had symptoms two days prior to the presenting in the OPD. Upper history and examination, still it's very valuable in today's errors also. Hypertension management is very ignored in the transplant killing, but it is one of the most important predisposing factor for the aortic dissection. Mortality related to aortic dissection is very high. Our advances in the surgical and endovascular techniques have lower mortality rate overall for those who are diagnosed early and treated in a timely fashion. Next one. Next one. Severe aortic dissection can be responsible for the graft failure, graft dysfunction. Diagnosis should be considered mostly in patients with uncontrolled BP, vague and transient neurological disorder, and biological positivity or inflammatory markers. There are studies which say that there are higher inflammatory markers in patients with aortic dissections. This is one of my last slides, and uh, I think I won't end my presentation before paying my gratitude to the donor and the family and the whole nephrology and the transplant team at the Gangaram Hospital, which helped me in that time. And uh, I got this picture from my recipient, and he allowed me to present in the my presentation, and he's very happy. And recently, he did the river rafting, which I'm really scared because he had aortic dissection, so that he doesn't dwell more towards events. And uh, that's, uh, I'll end my presentation here. And we all agree that the transplant changes life, as you can see the smile on this recipient. Thank you so much. Certainly, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, can you unshare the slide? And we'll have a quick discussion. It's a 9.5 and we'll have five, more, uh, five minutes or seven minutes. Uh, we'll start with the Chilean, sir, and I'll go with the Ilango. Then from audience uh, response, we'll... Yeah, excellent presentation. and. Uh... Thank you. First of all, I should uh, congratulate you for your cuts to take that uh, uh, donor kidney from you, such a young donor. And uh, you said that the kidney uh, grew after some time. That is, repeat scan showed the length. So still they could accommodate in the right iliac fossa. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so two yeah. kidneys there, uh, roughly eight centimeter each, no problem. Yes, because we transplanted into adult recipient actually with a good BMI and there was enough space actually. Yes, they grew and it has been seen like by one and a half year, you have the GFR is like the maximum and the kidney grew within the next three to six months, around two to six folds. And actually this patient had a fairly controlled blood pressure. You said uh, with the yes. and on uh, calcium channel, he was doing good. And yes. the AV fistula closure, uh, generally we don't do it. Most of the patients, yes. they survey with the uh, AV fistula, which was uh, fairly dilated. Yes. And uh, you think uh, it should be closed on all patients in, in two, three years if you feel it is not necessary? Yes, it depends, sir, on the flow, actually. Frankly speaking, I did not monitor with the ultrasound AV fistula. Probably my mind was totally focused for the end block kidney growth, GFR and everything. I think I ignored that part. I do admit that. I think one should see the AV fistula flow. And depending upon that, we can take the decision actually regarding the closure. Generally, we don't close, but yeah. as the vascular surgeon advice, and we agreed on that and we closed the fistula. Thank you. Ilango and Raj. And uh, Raj, you want to add anything? After Ilango's uh, comments, you can add a few things. Lango, are you there? Yeah, yes. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Um, I think Dr. Uh, Dr. Sum Suman, I think the patient is lucky to have a fantastic clinician like you. And, like, I think you did a great yes, job uh, many years back. And then also, I think a meticulous clinician alone can save a patient with a very rare surgical or a very rare uh, medical problem. And also, you took so much pain in not only transferring to a center and also made sure patient gets a, get a bed on time and get operated the next day. I think. Uh, Thanks to you, I think this guy must be alive. Uh, um, I mean, a couple of times you have saved his life. I think he's living for twice. Thank you, sir. Um, and uh, I think, ma'am, uh, just uh, 
to add what you was presented. I think relative hypotension uh, can be also a vas vasovagal phenomenon in, uh, in aortic dissection. So you listed a list yes. of causes. Yes, it could be vasovagal because of the pain. Uh, agreed on that. But again, you know, he had decreased urine output also. Like this patient was very meticulous in monitoring. So these symptoms and sign couldn't ignore actually because he wasn't too antihypertensive and all of a sudden the BP dropped. He had decreased urine output. And in the meantime, I got the report of MRI. It was very fast and I could not get time actually, you know, to do other investigation. And I just immediately shifted the patient. So, yeah. I, I, I had a patient recently who, who had a um, pseudoanism compressing on the renal vein presenting as like similar, like what you presented, doubling. It was doubling, the creatinine was doubling every day. And so it was like uh, third third month or fourth month post-transplant. Uh, patient was operated elsewhere. So I think surgical complications do come and uh, and they they double, they like in your case, how, how it presented. And how often, uh, um, uh, how did you manage to get consent, ma'am? Like, did you had problems in getting consent for dual kidney or um, a pediatric kidney in an adult? No, he was very motivated. The recipient was very motivated and he knew all the risks. We explained everything, the risk of the graft thrombosis because this was the first kind of transplant at our center. He was again, he was very dedicated and motivated enough to undergo, yes. There was no problem regarding consent. What yeah. made you to ask for MRA? Actually, uh, that is he, the one which gave us the clue. Yes, yeah. He was playing badminton and after playing badminton, he had this uh, problem of backache. So I thought there is some kind of slip disc or some kind of a sacral strain and that I suspected. I couldn't suspect that okay, I'm dealing with aortic dissection at that point. Yeah. Raj, add a few points and we'll close. Okay. Fantastic presentation by ma'am. Congratulations, ma'am, for the presentation as well as saving the patient's life. And uh, I'm just uh, amused with the uh, comment given by Dr. Chilean, sir. Like the kidneys grows and uh, uh, will that uh, accommodate be accommodated in the iliac fossa? That's a very valid point, whether it will be compressing the arteries and vein and putting extra pressure. That is a good point, valid point to be considered in these patients. And very uh, nature has a... <laughs> high healing point and the kidneys are getting accommodated in that uh, renal bed quite nicely. And uh, thank you, Naching. Nothing much to add. The, both the presentations are very good. And uh, like it's like uh, Ilangon said, told, patient was lucky to have a, a nephrologist like you to uh, diagnose. Thank you. Yeah. you. Ma'am, Sachin thank Soni, please go ahead, uh, Sachin. Um, uh, different question to... Uh, uh, the problem. Uh, what I got to know recently that uh, in pediatric transplant less than six years of age, when you declare brainstem death, uh, that uh, it should be 12 hours apart and not six hours apart. Any Anyone can throw light on it? Because the case presented, they say, she said uh, six it was hours. six hours apart. And what I know uh, that it should be 12 hours apart. Any Any opinion? Ma'am, you should answer that. Yes, I think. Tamil Nadu is six hours. Tha. Yeah, it was. Six hours. I think, uh, as per my knowledge, it was six years. Maybe I think Dr. Sachin is agreeing. Maybe he recently reviewed. I'm not aware of that changing in the guidelines of uh, you know, certification. You know, yeah. maybe Dr. Sachin can tell. Actually, uh, know, actually, what happened recently? We had a potential uh, pediatric transplant four and a half years, and uh, we had we approached ZTCC and then in turn. Uh, uh, the uh, state office was approached and uh, the input I got from them was uh, like in adults, it is six hours apart and in uh, pediatric transplants, uh, uh, pediatric donors, uh, minors, it should be 12 hours apart. So I really don't know whether it comes from a guideline yes, yes. or it is a state specific guideline, Maharashtra specific guideline. I'm not aware. I will uh, check what is the actually. science behind it? Wait, all of us. I um, don't think maybe they want to give like some, some more time for twelve hours. Even in yeah. Tamil Nadu, it's twelve hours. Twelve hours, okay. In pediatric donors, it's twelve hours. Minors, it is twelve hours. Okay, right. Okay. So maybe it, it has to do with like uh, um, uh, potential of reversibility. Maybe more in pediatric. I don't know. Like in adults, it's six hours. You declare brain dead. In in pediatrics, you give more time. Maybe that that may be a logical. Uh, 
explanation uh, scientifically maybe we need to look, in, look into it what is that so if it is in tamil nadu i am sure uh, there is some some reason and it may be there in other states also because generally the guidelines get copied or it may be a noto guideline i don't know dr anil kumar said even in karnataka it's the same it's a yeah, Nice yeah, like a... Ambit, sir, uh, la, la, I think you want to comment on the first presentation by Sandhya, sir. Are you there? Yes, yes. Um, uh, well, uh, the one yeah. that I wanted to comment about the first case was that uh, I never stop uh, uh, Bactrim uh, throughout the life of the patients. I yes, never yes. stop at six months. And uh, maybe I, I might have missed uh, uh, Nocardia. But I have not had a diagnosed case of nocardiasis in my uh, series. I have never Actually, stopped. Nocardia, co-trimoxal does not prevent nocardia. I think uh, I am very sure about it. By both cases, they were on uh, co-trimoxal uh, prophylaxis uh, at the time of uh, infection. In fact, after first case, uh, for me, it happened on 50th uh, post-op day. In fact, I uh, PSG, at that time I was in PSG, we had a central AC system. So I... Took a duct from the AC duct, I took a smear for nocardia and it was positive. But then I discussed with the back uh, microbiology people and they said wherever you take it will be positive for nocardia. It may not be the mm -hmm. direct reason for the case. But cotrimus I give for one year. I give for mm -hmm. one year. And uh, for that case, you had UTI. I think you should have prolonged the cotrimus of Sandhya. Yes, multiple uh, episodes of all uh, pan resistant UTIs, sir. It was all carbapenem. Oh, what I myself not have helped. Yes, so we had uh, stopped it and his creatinine was also going up. Okay. At about six months, it was stopped. Uh, I think both speakers have been receiving yeah. a lot of information from comments, and it's a good thing. And, and uh, madam, you opened a new vista of thinking uh, in your uh, case. Sandhya has presented nicely and uh, the AGSA 48, the, all the sequencing, all you have showed is some new thing, at least to me, we don't, I don't uh, do go for, otherwise we don't know whether you are septron sensitive or non-sensitive, I think you uh, you made a right point over here. And ma'am, and uh, you, you you just finished one word with the banter surgery, you, you can go gone for a little more detail about surgery, uh, because you, you big complication and you finish it in a very small statement. Uh, ma'am, Samalada, ma'am, can you... <laughs> Yes, actually, uh, you want to know about the uh, IoT dissection or like the end block? No, 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 IoT dissection. I know it's, it's a yes. big surgery, it seems. You know, you have to remove yes, the. Yes, yes. The uh, ventil, the ventil, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ventil procedure was done and with IoT call replacement also. And because mm -hmm. the whole procedure was carried out the other hospital, the perioperative course, although it was smooth, actually, I was in touch with the nephrologist there, actually. Who, and other technology, I really don't know much about, but they have done the bental surgery and the IoT call replacement. Now the patient is on anticoagulants and is doing well with the triple immunosuppression. Yes. Madam, was it, madam, one small question. Was yes. a dissection going into the common iliac artery? Yes, yes. It was so going where into the did they, Where did they, after bental procedure, that uh, um, graft arteries? I think probably after surgery, Raj, this dissection must have subsided. Uh, they would not have touched the down portion. Probably they have yes. done only the upper. Uh, that's what it would happen, right? Um, yes, I have got actually, I can check the surgical details, surgical notes of that, you know, discharge summary. Sorry, I couldn't see the whole surgical procedure notes of this the, the part of forum, So that's a learning point for us. You know, but but I, Raj, I, I will send you Dr. Vail for sure. I will send you the surgical details. Okay. So interesting. And you diagnosed it rightly and you saved the patient's life and you took the help from somebody else when, when surgeon when I was absent on that particular day. It's a great mom. It's a both presentation was excellent. We learned a lot Thank from you. Uh, Thank thanks. You. And all the, I think uh, our aim is to stick on to time, but it's, we exceeded 10 minutes because it's, it's all, you know, it's, it's a give and take at 10 minutes. Okay for us. Uh, thanks for attending all the viewers and the expressive panelists, Ilongo sir and um, Dr. Chalian sir. Uh, so nice uh, to have Ilongo from, uh, from a long distance. And Chalian sir, you, over the years, you showed your experience here and, uh, and really thankful to everyone. And thank the MQ people for you know, organizing this consistently last uh, two years. Um, uh, thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll continue to show the same interest in coming years and we educate ourselves. And the sharing knowledge is the only way to go, way, go forward. Thanks and good night.
Thank you so much. Good night. Good, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Alanga. Thanks, Alanga. <laughs> Alanga, sir. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, sir. You look like a movie actor, Alanga. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I thought the villain. Villain, I thought you would say. <laughs> no, no. Thank villain you. is the most likable person, no? In the... <laughs> Yes, yes. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, sir